Hello, fleet, and welcome to the very first episode of World of Warships Epic Battles with me, Chase. And this is really the first opportunity for me to show you just how freaking amazing things can get in World of Warships. In this episode, I'll show you just what battleships and carriers are capable of when they're played properly. I will start with the battleships because that's the ship class that a lot of people are probably looking forward to playing. So here I am in my tier 5 Congo class battleship. As I just gotten her during the weekend beta, she's still in her stock configuration. Now unlike World of Tanks, where stock configurations are usually terrible, stock configuration ships are a totally different story. If played correctly, they're just as lethal as their fully upgraded counterparts. Before I get into the actual gameplay, I just want to give you all a very brief overview of battleships. They're the most durable ships in the game, with high HP pools and pretty thick armor. This is further helped by a unique consumable that battleships have, that allow them to restore a certain amount of their health. It can only be used a few times however, but if it's used at the right times, it can significantly increase your survivability. They are however pretty big and pretty slow at turning around, so don't expect your battleships to turn as quickly as a destroyer. Their guns can do considerable amounts of damage if they hit the right spots. They are however extremely valuable ships, so the cost of repairing them and also their value during a domination game cannot be understated. So enough of me talking about things that all of you already know, what's going on in this battle? Well, first, before I get started, I want to give a huge shout out to the people in my division. So, Mindful Crane and Chamoto, here's a big shout out to all of you. So, let's take a look at the game. Well, this game started really, really poorly for me, as I very quickly came under fire from three different Fusos. Hence why at this point of the game, I'm already down to about half health. Even worse, we've lost both of our allied battleships, and the enemy team still has their four Fusos and their one Congo. To make everything even worse, we're also down about 300 points in domination. In many circumstances, being down 300 points and facing 5 battleships in a single battleship is a very very fast way to losing a battle. I quickly use this island right now to get out of the engagement and to use that time to examine the tactical situation. So what are my options? Well, we do have 2 of the 3 cap points, and we are gaining points faster than they are. So in theory, I could just disengage and try to hunt down their carriers or something. But there's a pretty high chance that they'll just cap B and that'll lead to a loss. We don't have a lot of surface combatants left, so the only viable option really would be to fight their battleships closest to the B point. And in that sense, if we manage to sink both of them, it'll give us a great chance, or at least a reasonable chance of winning this battle. The main reason this option would work is that their battleships are very spread out. So even though they have 5 battleships, the most I'll have to take on at any one point would be like 2 battleships. And 2 on 1? Eh, those are favorable odds. So I'm taking a look at the battle, and the only ship that's close to B on my team is a tier 5 American cruiser, the Omaha. Now this Omaha has already engaged the enemy team's Congo, and without much hesitation, I decide to jump into this battle. Now, interestingly enough, before I pop out of this island, I do see that the Congo shells were flying towards the Omaha, which means that its guns are not aimed at me, and therefore I have the element of surprise. So I unleash my first salvo. And I do get a few hits, I think. Here I have one hit, and I think I hit two more times. And I really don't do that much damage, and that's something you have to understand about battleships. Like at long range, hitting a critical part of the ship is not the easiest thing to do, and it is a little bit based on RNG. But, you know, I do land, manage to land a few shots, and I'm trying to wait for my guns to reload. And of course, because battleship guns are massive, they do take some time to reload. But still, those guns do carry significant force, as you will see in a little bit. So, I fire my second salvo, and my second salvo falls a little bit too far behind the ship. Now, you might want to consider that a wasted salvo, but for me, that just taught me this is how much I have to lead the ship by. And so for the third shot that I'm going to make in a little bit, I have now figured out just how much lead I have to give this enemy ship. Now, surprisingly for me, the Congo and the Fuso are both engaging a stationary Omaha. I'm not sure why they don't shoot at me at all, maybe just because the Omaha is sitting still. As a tip to all you players, this is World of Warships, not World of Tanks. Please don't sit still. The ship's survivability is determined you know, a lot by based on how it moves. So anyways, now that i figured out the lead for the enemy battleship, I let it and I fired a full salvo and take a look at this. I hit a critical component right there and boom, 31.5k damage and the battleship immediately explodes. And that's the thing, if you can hit a critical part with a battleship's armor piercing shells, you will do absolutely incredible amounts of damage. Now the enemy Fuso, in an attempt to dodge torpedoes dropped by my, tor my team's torpedo bombers, has turned behind an island. Now, while this is not a bad thing to do per se, because it does temporarily get him out of the engagement zone, I know where he is, which means that when he does pop out from behind an island, I would have had him lined up already. And of course, as you saw with the, you know, the shot I put on the Congo earlier, 
Armor-piercing shells hit at the right spots can be absolutely devastating. So, I properly lead him, and as soon as his bow comes out, I fire, which means the shots will land right there into the magazine, and boom, his ship goes up as well. So, pretty good. Now I've taken out two of their battleships. The score is now much, much closer together, but, of course, I got hit by torpedo bombers and there is nothing I can do here to get out of the way of these torpedoes because hey I'm still in a battleship and this thing really doesn't turn very quickly however battleships like I said earlier are incredibly durable and here's where the durability comes in so I make sure that I'm not flooding and then as soon as that's done and I, I do take the damage I pop the consumable and look I am repairing back up to the, you know about 20,000 health and that puts me into a combat worthy position and I can still continue to fight now the enemy team and I don't understand why they were like this are still more interested in fighting the Omaha on my team than to fight me even though I've just knocked out two of their battleships so this is a little bit interesting Anyways, the Fuso on their team is just not paying attention to me at all. And so, of course, if you don't pay attention to a battleship and I'm close enough to be able to realize where your weak spots generally are, I'm going to do some massive damage to you. So, you know, I'm just kind of lining my ship up, getting my guns lined up, leading the target properly, and opening fire. And, of course, these shells are going to hit very, very early on because I've sort of figured out just how far to lead a Fuso. And there you go, there's some damage, and those were my two rear guns, and there's some more damage. And of course, in those three hits, I've, well, I mean, even though it says seven hits, but the, the three numbers that popped up, I did about, what, 13, 14,000 damage, which is quite a significant amount of damage, though. So, yeah, and neither the Fuso in front nor the Fuso that's coming up behind are engaging me at all, so... I guess partially in this battle, I have to thank them for not paying attention to me at all while I get to just sort of pound away on them. But of course, they're still about 100 points ahead. But if you notice, I went into the B cap and I've actually managed to cap it. So now we are up you know, two caps to one, which is giving us a point advantage as well in terms of how many you know, points we gain for every tick. So continuing on. So this Fuso is taking torpedo hits from our Omaha. Now the Omaha is one of the few American cruisers that are equipped with torpedoes, and they can prove handy when dealing with big targets. So at first I was thinking, well, if they manage to finish him off with torpedoes, then I'm gonna shift my guns to the other Fuso. Of course that didn't happen, so I had to continue firing. Now at this time you're noticing that there's fire coming in from behind me as well, because there is another battleship behind me. And that is, actually pretty bad situation for me to be in because I'm essentially sandwiched between two battleship forces. But I have sort of angled my ship in a way that presents the smallest target to the ship behind me. So we managed to sink that Fuso. Now as soon as we sink that Fuso, we put ourselves into the point lead. And as soon as we have the point lead, all me and the Omaha have to do is survive for a little bit of time. And if we can survive until about a thousand points, this battle is ours and we've actually managed to win. But, of course, life doesn't always go the way you want. And right about 980-something points, as we're about to win, the Fuso on the enemy team manages to sink our Omaha. So, I have managed to recover some more HP because the repair kit did come up. So, I did repair some more of my health. And I'm starting to engage this, uh, this, this Fuso. And I'm trying my best to sort of delay this team as long as I can from doing you know anything useful and productive. And just trying to survive those extra few seconds, because really, I mean, the tactical situation right now is meaning, you know, if I survive another minute or so, I'd probably be dead, because there's two battleships, and all their carriers are now focused on me. I do take some bad damage from the Fuso, and there's another torpedo wave, and I love this. Watch this. So, the torpedoes hit, my steering's gone, my gun's gone, my engine's gone, I managed to repair it in the nick of time, I was on fire and flooding, and I had 600 health left, and I managed to stall just long enough to hit 1,000 points, and we actually claimed the win. Isn't that awesome? I love battleships. They're amazingly durable and they're really, really strong in the right hands. Now you gotta admit, that was a pretty fun battle, right? But I actually don't consider myself the greatest battleship driver. I'm actually primarily a cruiser carrier guy. So of course, this video would not be complete without me showing you some carrier gameplay. This is one of those carrier battles that a lot of people are not a huge fan of. I'm in my tier 5 US carrier, the Independence, and the enemy team has three Langleys. So, in most cases, even though the Independence is a higher tier carrier, it can simply get overwhelmed by the amount of airplanes that the lower tier carriers can throw at it. Now, this is assuming that people actually decide to coordinate their actions, which in a lot of cases, I'm gonna feel that this is not gonna happen as much. Anyways, 
I'm just going to talk to you all about carriers a little bit, sort of an overview of it, I guess. A lot of people treat carriers like they're the arty of World of Tanks, and the only thing I can say about that is that there's only a surface resemblance there. The resemblance coming primarily from the view you have when you're playing carriers, this top-down kind of view. But the playstyle of carriers is vastly different than arty in World of Tanks. First of all, you're mobile, and you're capable of moving around while conducting your strikes, unlike artillery, which is mostly camping in one corner of the map. And this allows you to keep an eye on the movements of the enemy team, and at the same time allow you to move to areas that are safe, and at the same time keep rather relatively close to your own fleet, and to be able to help them out. Now, that is not always fully viable, but you have to sort of adapt the carrier play to the circumstances. Now, second, carrier aircraft are vastly different from artillery shells. They can be controlled by the player, and planes can be lined up in a way that will increase the chances of hitting dramatically. And finally, the carrier's role is to support the team as a whole. They're, you know, with scouting, protecting the fleet with fighters, and then also hitting the enemy team, which is some things that Artie did not really have to do in World of Tanks. Anyways, so how do I deal with this battle? Well, surface combatants-wise, we're about equal. In fact, in terms of battleships, I think we have a slight advantage. So the biggest threat coming from the enemy team is their three carriers. And so my first priority, in sort of irrespective of everything else, is to neutralize at least one of those carriers and to at least lower the sort of carrier ratio from 3 to 1 to 2 to 1. So I've got two of my torpedo bomber squadrons, and I'm trying to find their carriers. And I'm sort of ignoring the battleships and other ships because I'm trusting my fleet to be able to take care of them. And I'm thinking that if I leave them with so many carriers, it can bomb them all the time that they wouldn't survive very long. So first priority is take care of the uh, enemy bombers. Now, of course, I found an enemy fighter behind me, so I sent my fighter squadron to deal with them, which is something you have to do. And that's kind of the trade-off sometimes you have to make, whether you protect your own bombers from enemy fighters. Mind you, if, you're, if the enemy fighters get to your bombers, they will chew them up. Anyways, I do spot two of the enemy's carriers, and this is great, because as soon as you know where they are, you can precision yourself for a strike. Now, you've noticed that I've kept both of my torpedo bomber squadrons very, very close together. Not only that, but I've kept them sort of within the same distance of each other as well. So, I am not going to auto bomb, which is most what most people do. I'm actually going to use a manual bombing option, which allows me a to drop the torpedoes a lot closer, and it also allows me to sort of predict the movement of the enemy carrier. So there you go. I'm predicting that he's moving not very fast and moving a little bit. I line it up. I drop all the torpedoes and take a look. The block of torpedoes they dropped. There's two torpedoes for every one of those dots, right? And there you go. The massive hits, and that carrier is pretty much crippled. And of course, with the flooding damage, it sinks. So now. This entire battle has gone from a 3-on-1 carrier battle to a 2-on-1 carrier battle, and that becomes a lot more of a manageable scenario. Not only that, but there's also two fewer squadrons out there bombing the ships on my team, which will give them a sort of a respite from the constant attacks as well. Now, the next minute or two is actually going to be quite boring, and nothing really happens. And this is one of the things that all carrier drivers will have to understand. Unlike in World of Tanks, where you get to fire an artillery shell and that your arty immediately starts to reload, in World of Warships, your planes actually go there, and then they have to fly all the way back. Now, especially with the limited number of planes that early tier carriers carry, it is unwise to lose any of your airplanes to... I guess other creative playstyles, that's what I can say right now, because you know, one day when I do get to show you bigger and bigger carriers, I can explain to you how else you can deal with certain things if you wish to launch a quick second strike. Now, I'm trying to get all my planes back and it's taking a very long time. And this is also primarily my fault because I also took my carrier really, really, really far away from the front lines. Now, at the time in this battle, it wasn't the incorrect thing to do. And even though generally it's better to keep your carrier closer, I guess, to the action, but not too, too close, yet not too far, in this particular case, I want to keep my carrier as far away as possible because I was worried that if all the Langley's decided, hey, you know, on a second strike, let's go and hit this guy with every single torpedo squadron they've got, you know, I could have been in a lot of trouble. And so you know, I was being, I guess, more conservative in my playstyle, and that's why I was sort of further away. But as I sort of analyzed the situation and realized where the enemy ships were, I realized, hey, you know what? I don't have to be so far away. I can actually move up. And this is one of the best things about this carrier. The Independence is actually one of the fastest carriers in the game. And it allows you to sort of move quickly between one point and another. In fact, its speed is so good that you know, there are certain uh, cruisers and destroyers that actually have trouble trying to catch it. So this is one of the great advantages that the independence has. 
Now, I do start to get my airplanes back, and you'll see that there is also quite a time for them to reload, rearm, refuel, whatever. And it really takes quite a while for all this to actually be, I guess, completed. So what do you do as a carrier driver during this period of time? Some people would just zone out and you know wait for their things to reload. But really, one of the most important things you do at this time is you have to look at the map and you have to keep track of where things are. So take a look at your map and see, OK, where are the enemy battleships? Are they a threat to me? Are they a threat to another ship on my team? You know, this battleship here, had he been beating up on our battleship, he probably would have been my second target. But no, I take a look at his health and I look at the battleship's health on my team and I say, you know what, he's probably got a decent chance at beating this enemy battleship, so I'm not that worried. And so I'm not going to make that a priority. Again, there's a cruiser there and should I go and protect him with my fighters? And you know, again, it's the same thing. There's still two carriers left and if I send two torpedo bomber squadrons to try to take one of them out, I'm still gonna need that fighter cover on my bombers. And sadly, I am not gonna cover my fleet. Now, there are different play styles with carriers. You know, if you decide to keep like, you know, a, an FCS module or whatever that grants you more fighters, then you can play more protector and that's a different play style as well. Um, I generally like to prefer the balanced option where you sort of get a mixture of uh, fighters and bombers. And so anyways, anyways, back to this game. I'm not going to go deviate onto other carriers and other playstyles later on. So again, see, the battleship's getting wiped out, so I'm not worried about it. Um, and I'm really just going to go hunt down the last two carriers because they're still going to pose a reasonably big threat to wiping out our battleships. Now, as you can tell, I don't like to keep my torpedo bombers too far apart. And the, there's a really, really good reason for this is because if they're apart, when you're dropping your torpedoes on the ships you know, in, in the game, the torpedo squadrons, if they're further apart, they also drop the torpedoes further apart. And so when they're dropping further apart, what ends up happening is that the enemy team's ship will have that extra few seconds to respond to the torpedoes that are being dropped. So when I keep them sort of very, very close together, it gives me that extra punch, first of all, on the torpedoes that do sort of all hit together, and it also really reduces the amount of time the enemy team can react to what is being dropped into the water. Anyways, so I'm escorting my torpedo bombers again and it's really interesting because the enemy carriers have really seemed shown no interest in coming to fight me which actually was a bit of a mistake because they really could have overwhelmed me very early on and they would have made the battle very very you know lopsided for their team but it didn't happen so that's good because it gives me another chance to take out another one of their carriers and as you can tell one of their torpedo bombers just dropped a wave of torpedoes and as you can tell it's a very very different drop pattern from mine they, they drop the torpedoes and it's like a good distance away from the target they're trying to drop on and i'm dropping significantly closer and really giving very very little chance to react and this is one of the things that you have to understand in the future when you're playing against good carrier drivers is that you cannot wait until the torpedoes have already dropped before you start to do anything. You have to react and deal with whatever is coming ahead of time. And this is oftentimes when if you do see me one day post a video of me dodging torpedoes like crazy, I'm always preempting the action and I'm making it difficult by, by changing the angles of my ship. I'm just trying to make their lives difficult and making them sort of miscalculate where I will be. But of course, in this case, I'm not going to make that mistake because it's a lively. <laughs> Lively's don't go very fast, which means perfect targets, if you know what I mean. And so, again, they're not really protecting themselves as much. Uh, the two Langley's could have gotten together and given themselves a lot better chance. And in fact, all three of them could have gotten together and given themselves a lot better chance. But again, they give me a chance to sort of drop my torpedoes in a very, very, very clustered manner. And of course, when those hit, they do massive amounts of damage. And there you go. I wiped out another one of their carriers. And so, you know, this is one of those battles where a lot of people initially might go, wow, it's three on one. Yeah, what chance do you stand? I just showed you. I actually stand a pretty good chance against even three carriers as long as the carrier is played correctly. As long as you decide what to prioritize and what not to deal with, you know, you could make your life, I guess, significantly better and also increase the winning chances for your team. You know, and not only this, right now, if you look at it, we have all three caps. You know, they have literally no points. I've wiped out two of their three carriers. And pretty much this is going to be a very easy, comfortable win for my team. And so hopefully, after going through battleships and carriers, you all now have a better sense of what these ships are capable of when played properly. Because in a lot of cases during the beta weekend and stuff, a lot of people are still figuring out how to play their ships correctly. And a lot of people will come to a conclusion that certain ships are terrible. Carriers are actually amazing, don't let anybody tell you otherwise.
And that's all folks for the very first episode of Epic Battles with me Chase and I'm just going to leave you all here with a bit of a picture and the reason why this picture is here is because well I still haven't made the end screen properly for this particular show because you know first episode and all. So this is a bit of a placeholder for the next episode when I do get around to it you will see something completely different. Aside from all that I hope you all enjoyed this episode and you know if you have any comments or whatever please put them in the comment section below. So aside from all that I hope you all take care and I'll see you all in the I see you soon.